Uh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and this is the third session in our study of T.S. Eliot's poetry. Uh, in this session, we're actually going to take up uh, the first great poem of T.S. Eliot, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And we will apply uh, some of those terms that I gave in a list in the last section, terms that identify the main features of modern poetry, or modernist poetry, if you will, uh, features that bespeak the revolution in poetry that Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot propagated collaboratively. Now we'll begin with the title, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and we can sense immediately that there's something wrong in this title. A man with a name like J. Alfred Prufrock, a modern figure, for sure, has no business in a love song, a very traditional mode of poetry going back thousands of years. That incongruity in the title, in turn, I believe, indicates the structure of this poem at large and of many other poems in Eliot's early career, namely the difference between romance and realism. These indeed are the two voices that we see in Eliot that correspond to the dictum of William Butler Yeats that poetry is a quarrel with oneself. Just beneath the title, the song, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, we get one of the allusions that are so characteristic of Eliot's poetry. Uh, this is what Eliot meant by saying he was a classicist in literature. That is to say, a poet who ransacks the literature of the past, trying to dig up valuable and meaningful items that are still relevant to us today, that can still un help us understand our lives today and help us know how to live our lives in this crisis of belief period. The Italian passage under the title uh, is an excerpt from Dante's Inferno. And it describes Dante reaching a level in lower hell where the sinners are so ashamed of their depravities committed in the upper world that the last thing they want is to be remembered in the upper world. Uh, in upper hell, by contrast, sinners asked Dante to please remember me too, uh, the folks back home. These sinners in lower hell would not speak to Dante, including this character who appears as a tongue of flame, an obvious inversion of the Holy Spirit appearing as a tongue of fire. In this case, the tongue of flame, as it waggles, tells Dante, if I believed that anyone had ever come this deep in hell and gotten out again, I would not tell my story. But because no one has ever come this deep in hell and gotten back to earth, I will tell my story, which he does, and Dante, of course, does report it to the upper world. The point of the excerpt in Italian is to highlight the theme of loneliness, of isolation, of a man being unable to tell his story, which is exactly Prufrock's predicament. As we proceed into the poem proper, we begin with a, a question of identity. Let us go then, you and I. Who are these two figures, you and I? In modern literature, the author will not explain what he has done in his work. And so we have to infer who these two figures are, you and I, and it is possible we'll have different inferences among Eliot's readership. And it is also quite possible that a number of them may be perfectly plausible, acceptable. As long as they're plausible, I think we can accept a multitude of possibilities. In my case, I think the most persuasive possibility is that you and I 
are the two voices in proof rock. The realist proof rock versus the romantic proof rock longing to have a relationship that will break out of his loneliness. In fact, the rest of the poem will give us a narrative along those lines. What happens in the poem is that Prufrock is going to a party where he hopes to broach his feelings to a woman at the party. The question is whether he will get up enough nerve to actually say something, to sing his love song, or will he fail to do that? The first two lines of this poem have a romantic ring to them. They have a rhyme. They have a rather lovely image to offer. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. We can imagine a beautiful sunset, some clouds flat against the horizon, perhaps reflecting the last light. When we reach line three of Proof Rock, we have something entirely new in the history of English poetry. The evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized on a table. That motif accomplishes several purposes. The most immediate one is to indicate Prufrock's hopeless paralysis. He is prostrated before we even get into the poem where some action is needed on his part. But it also introduces a motif that scatters images throughout the poem, mainly images of Prufrock being dissected. We have that as to say, a pair of hands that lift and drop a question on the plate. We have a pair of eyeballs, eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. Uh, we have a severed head brought in on a platter like that of John the Baptist. Uh, we have the nerves in patterns on a screen as we proceed. And indeed, Prufrock would be taken apart psychologically as the poem goes on. Now we consider, we continue in this mode of psychological realism, in this stream of caution, consciousness fashion, where Prufrock exhibits his innermost mind to Eliot's readers. And we find him moving through the streets, presumably of Boston. They would be crooked streets in that case. Um, let us go through half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights, etc. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Now, in our last session in that checklist of eight or nine elements of modern poetry, I listed the music of poetry as one important feature. Poetry in modern times, not sounding like music necessarily, but being organized in the same way that music is organized. And perhaps the most important such parallel between poetry and music is the use of recurring motifs to structure a poem, perhaps replacing the narrative structure or similar structures of poetry in the past. And the, the word question is the most important of these recurring motifs in this poem. The question is whether he will, in fact, get up the courage to speak to this woman at the party. Now here already before he gets to the party, he is experiencing a failure of nerve. To lead you to an overwhelming question, oh, do not ask what is it? I can't face it now. Let us go and make our visit. We then have another one of these features of modern poetry, what I've been calling the jump cut of a movie. That is to say, we move immediately to another scene without any bridge or transition to bring us there. Instead, we see Prufrock at the party observing the women. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. 
Now this is another feature of Eliot's poetry at large. The past is always superior to the present. And so we have these giant figures of the past, this great Renaissance genius, Michelangelo. How is Prufrock supposed to insert himself into this conversation? Or maybe the women are trying to be one up on each other in the conversation. That doesn't help Prufrock either. We have other giant figures, Hamlet, John the Baptist, Lazarus risen from the dead. And they, along with Michelangelo, suffice to make Prufrock feel even more inferior, more insignificant, more unable to insert himself into the picture at the party. We then uh, move a little later into the evening where we see Prufrock, instead of attending to other guests at the party, he is staring in a solitary mood out the window, looking at the fog out there, a fog which recurs in some of Eliot's other poems, including The Wasteland, and which indicates the isolation of Prufrock and other characters, as, as we see, uh, from other people. Now, he proceeds to rationalize his failure of nerve, and indeed there will be time, he says. That theme of time, the meaning of time, is perhaps the most continuous theme throughout Eliot's career. It comes up importantly in the wasteland, hurry up please, it's time. And of course, it is the central issue in Four Quartets, that masterpiece at the end of Eliot's career. Naturalistically, time means getting old, getting another day or week or year advancing towards one's death. Uh, that is to say, the experience of a used up, wasted life. Can time mean anything more than that, naturalistically? seeing that it ends for each individual in the oblivion of lost consciousness. There will be time in any case to perhaps get up his nerve in this dinner party. Uh, there will be time, however, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Now in the past, a bold lover would not have to prepare a face. He would simply speak up broach his feelings directly to the woman of interest. Prufrock, of course, is a bundle of modern inhibitions and neuroses. And if he is going to bring off this act to break out of his loneliness, it will have to be through assuming a false identity as a bold lover. Can he do that? There'll be time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question that brutal word coming back on his plate. Works and Days of Hands. Uh, that title, Works and Days, refers to a poem by Hesiod, the ancient Greek poet and philosopher before the time of Socrates, who wrote a poem about meaningful time, the farmers raising their crop through the passing season. Whether Prufrock can measure up to meaningful time is another question. So there is time then, as this section ends, for a hundred indecisions, a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Meanwhile, the women are still talking about Michelangelo. And now at this point, toward the middle of the poem, for the first time, Prufrock discloses why he is so inhibited. There'll be time to wonder, do I dare, do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. So that's his problem. He has no physical attractiveness. Later, a few lines later, uh, he can imagine what they're saying about him. They will say how his hair is growing thin, how his arms and legs are thin. Prufrock is a walking skeleton 
much as T.S. Eliot was, in fact, so thin that he was rejected when he tried to sign up in the U.S. Army while he was in England. He is an inferior male, in short, judged by his external appearance, a man who is not able to attract any desirable woman. Ironically, we see that he has a rich internal consciousness and indeed something that might interest a woman if he were able to sing his love song. But he is too inhibited and perhaps justifiably so as he proceeds to work out this conflict between rom romance and realism within his own being. As he proceeds then, we alternate between romance and realism in Prufrock's mind. Uh, and we could start, I suppose, with a somewhat romantic motif. I have known them all, already known them all. The evenings, mornings, afternoons, the passing time sort of floating by, with Prufrock unable to do anything meaningful in that time. Then we have this harshly realistic image one of the numerous brilliant images that T.S. Eliot strikes off, making him, as Time magazine said in its obituary, a man who gave us the cathartic utterances of the age. Here's one of them. I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. Well, that's what a bachelor would literally do. He would measure out one spoonful a morning. That's all you get, you might say, psychologically speaking. It will have to last him through the day. When I am formulated sprawling on a pin, pinned and wriggling on the wall, he's, of course, trying to rationalize his failure of nerve. It seems that he's already more or less given up. And um, he's justifying his failure of nerve through the realistic proof rock that he, he would be pinned to the wall, caught in a cubby hole um, permanently as an inferior male if he did try to break out. How should I begin? How am I even going to broach this to the woman? To spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, how should I presume? Then the romantic proof rock pushes back. I have known the arms already known them all, arms that are braceleted in white and bare, inviting arms, my lady's romantic arms, an appealing image, immediately followed, however, by the realist proof rock describing my lady's arms more closely, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. That is, if you look closely, my lady's arms are hairy. So Prufrock then not only is seen too clearly by others, how his hair is growing thin, how his arms and legs are thin, perhaps he sees them too clearly to make romance possible. He proceeds then trying to work up the courage to put his question. Um, should I then presume, he says, how should I begin? How shall I put this? Now, this is the high point of the poem. When, when Prufrock goes so far as to try to formulate how he will address the woman. Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. Which is to say, shall I tell her, I am lonely, and I have seen my future. I will be one of those lonely men leaning out of windows if I don't do something, say something, at this party. No sooner than he gets that far in his formulation than he gives up completely. That will be as far as he gets. And at this point, we have nothing but rationalizations of his failure of nerve. He begins by envying a subhuman form of life. And it is true 
that this burden of self-consciousness is uniquely human. Negative self-consciousness. Awareness of one's own inferiority. In Prufrock's case, inferiority in the sexual selection process. That naturalistic um, mechanism that Charles Darwin described as the prime engine of evolution that winnows out winners and losers in the sexual selection and the losers simply will live a lonely wasted life as Prufrock sees before him. So in envy then of a primitive creature I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. The word silent is important. If only he could be like a lobster. He wouldn't have to talk. If you want something, you reach out with that giant claw and grab it. How enviable compared to this awful human burden of too much self-knowledge. The um, rationalization continues. Prufrock sort of drifts off, half oblivious. The afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers. Asleep, tired, it malingers, and so forth. And uh, should I, after tea and cake and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Rash, uh, these are, of course, uh, questions uh, that are not meant to be answered. And uh, the answer, if any, is no. He shouldn't have that much strength. Though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I've seen my head brought in on a platter. Now, we think of John the Baptist as having a shock of hair, like a male lion. If Prufrock were able to stir up enough feeling so that someone would lop off his head and bring it on, bring it on a platter, What's the first thing everyone would see? That damned bald spot. I've seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter. That source of his inhibitions is inescapable. I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. Uh, that would be, I suppose, the footman being time. And frankly, I was afraid. The language of rationalization continues with a very long, elaborate sentence. Uh, in the subjunctive mood, would it have been worthwhile? We know that's a rhetorical question. Would it have been worthwhile after the cups of marmalades, the tea, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to actually put on that mask of a bold lover? Suppose I did that. Would it have been worthwhile to have squeezed the universe into a ball? Now that's from one of the great love poems of all time, Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress, where a bold lover does indeed put to his mistress such an infallible argument as to why she should jump into bed with him that it is an infallible uh, way of getting the lady to follow his wishes. Should I have done that? Suppose I tried to do that, like Marvell's bold lover. Uh, suppose I did then roll all this towards some overwhelming question again. If one, this whole thing, all those subordinate clauses lead up to this if clause, if one, settling a pillow, and that to me is a contemptuous gesture as she rejects Prufrock, in his imagining. Would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not it at all. That's not what I meant at all. Now if we infer from this that the woman has previously given Prufrock what might be construed as some encouragement. That's the only reason he's thinking about her at all. But he can think now, as he imagines what would happen if he did broach his feelings, that he misunderstood what she said. And so, of course, it would not be worthwhile to have acted like a bold lover, to have 
squeeze the universe into a ball, to have bitten off the matter with a smile and so forth, and proceeded. He goes through the whole routine one more time. Would it have been worthwhile, after all, after the sun sets in dooryards and sprinkled streets and novels and teacups, etc.? And here's where we bring on the primitive movie camera of Eliot's time, around the year 1910. It is impossible to say what I mean. As if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. Would it have been worthwhile? And now he imagines being rejected even more dramatically and contemptuously by the woman. Would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning to the window should say, that is not it at all. That's not what I meant at all. Now, Prufrock wants us to understand at this point that though he and Hamlet in Shakespeare have a certain resemblance, he wants us to understand that he is not actually like Prince Hamlet. The resemblance, of course, is that both Prufrock and Hamlet have a notoriously long delay before they take action. Hamlet is told in Act One to avenge my most foul and unnatural murder. And it's only in, in the very last page of Act Five that he finally gets around to killing his father's murderer. So there is some resemblance to Prufrock who keeps delaying action concerning this woman at the party. Uh, but he wants us to understand that he actually resembles someone else in that play. And the figure he resembles is, of course, Polonius. This is excellent imitation blank verse, by the way. Anytime Eliot wants to imitate Shakespeare, he does this again in the wasteland with Antony and Cleopatra. He can do it beautifully. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am instead Polonius, an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, as Polonius did. Uh, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence and sometimes a bit of puss, uh, but almost at times the fool. What remains then is for Prufrock to decide what to do with the rest of his life. He obviously will go on being a lonely bachelor, but how will he comport himself? I grow old, I grow old. I will act like an old man. I will wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, presumably. An old man would be dabbling along the edge of the sea, which is where the setting of the rest of the poem lies. Meanwhile, he has to answer some practical questions. What to do about that bald spot? Shall I part my hair behind? And, of course, when you get older, you have to watch your digestion. Do I dare to eat a peach? Now, we have, as the poem ends, a final alternation, conflict possibly, between the realist Prufrock and the romantic Prufrock. The realist Prufrock says, I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. The romantic proof rock says, I have heard the mermaid singing, each to each. At least he can take refuge in fantasy, in imagination of a romantic nature. Then the realist proof rock strikes back concerning the mermaids. I do not think they will sing to me. For one last time, the romantic Prufrock surges back into control with further description of the mermaids. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, cross combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, beautiful long vowels, for harmonious sound. 
But the whole thing is undercut when the last word is given to Prufrock the realist. Till human voices wake us and we drown. Now we've heard those voices in the poem. Voices saying how his hair is growing thin, how his arms and legs are thin. Voices talking of Michelangelo. Voices saying, that is not it at all. That's not what I meant at all. So the actual voices that Prufrock's been hearing deprive him of the possibility of fantasy. We end then with a man who is unsuited for both romance and realism. He's too intelligent to take refuge in fantasy. Uh, but at the same time, he cannot make his way in the real world. We end up then with the same lonely, pathetic figure, the patient etherized on a table with which we started. We'll proceed with some other of Eliot's early poems in the next session.